Well, um, the first hip hop documentary ever, you know what I'm saying, was named Star Wars. I was 16 years old. I was one of, I would want to say I was one of the key players in there because I had a lot of parts, and um, I was one of the definitely uh, top ten graffiti artists in the game back then, like from the street street, not trying to do canvases and go overseas and all that, but I mean really hitting them subway cars and out of every 10 cars on the one or the three line, I had seven on each side, outside, not just the inside with with artwork. Yeah, I put in that work. And he's really talented. Um, I actually saw something you did mm-hmm. and um, I was like, wow, he's really, he's really good at it. So, yeah. and I know that could be their, you know, therapeutic for some people. Mm-hmm. And um, I like, I, I like that you do that because it's different from what the people that know you for as DJ. And a lot of people don't know that you did yeah. graffiti work. I left, cause I left that alone. Cause you got to understand back then I was 16, 17, 18 and um, it was different, you know, parts of the game with graffiti you know you had beef with guys you got to watch out for the police um if you caught somebody slipping you ain't like you you rob them you know what i'm saying whether with their goose down or their new pumas or mm-hmm. all their spray paint whatever like it was part of the game it was just like a territorial thing so once i had got famous from the music side decades later it was like you know, I don't really want to do this no more. This was mm-hmm. a bad part of my coming up, which it was out of love, but it was right. negative sides to it. I didn't really want to rock with it. Mm-hmm. But then as I went on, so many people just kept hitting me like, yo, why are you not doing your art? Yo, yo, why are you? And I didn't really want to tell them why, but right. that's the reason why I kind of strayed away from it. But now it's like, look, it is what it is. You know, I'm still nice with it. We got a lot of big offers like mm-hmm. on the money side to do it, you know, outside of music. So, you know. And everything turned out positive for you. So Exactly. That's awesome. I love mm-hmm. that. Yeah. Um, who discovered you? Like how did you become famous? You know, I, I can't say that anybody really discovered me. What could, I can say is that when um I came out of jail it was about nineteen ninety, late ninety, ninety one. And I seen DJs like Mar G, DJ SNS, Brucey B, Kid Capri, like they was doing that thing with the music. Now, let's take it back to the eighties and the late seventies mm-hmm. when I was DJing. We just did it for the fun. Again, right. like I said, so now they was getting money. And I was like, damn, they get paid to do this shit now? Like, you know what I'm saying? Maybe I need to, you know, put my feet back into it. So I started doing the mixed tapes mm-hmm. and the first mixtape I did was like late 93 early 94 with a Puerto Rican DJ demo from Harlem it was called Warning Part 1 and the response I got from that was crazy now meanwhile I'm doing clubs in the hood B&B Disco Marina Bar the Hun 4th Street and 2nd Avenue anybody from Spanish Harlem or Harlem know what that was about like I'm I'm putting in my street work but the mixtape made a lot of noise and I said you know what let me go just get some track boards and everything and dedicate my time and my money into this and get back. Like, I'm just looking to feed me and get on. Mm-hmm. Like Personally, I'm not looking for no fame. Yep. I'm not looking for that. I'm just trying to eat because right. I'm back on the pavement. And unfortunately, I just got so hot at what I was doing. It had to be around 98. No, it was here, it was here about 99, 2000. When I just really got so, so hot. Like, I've been getting hot little by little. Mm -hmm. But back then, I got so, so hot. And um, Chris Lighty reached out to me, rest in peace, and wanted to sign me to the record Mm -hmm. uh, record deal. Uh, Steve Rifkin wanted to sign me to Loud Records. There was a lot of people reaching out. And when Funkmaster Flex had finally went on the air, and he just took it on. was playing freestyles off my mixtape mm-hmm. with my name on it on the wow. air and he finally was like yo man who's DJ K Slay like every car that rides by me on the west side highway I hear his name on the tape and everything and um, I went up for the meeting for Hot 97 cause of Flex wow and Tracy Clarity you know I came in the office and she was like hey look 
I don't know what it is that you do, but Flex has never been this adamant or in my office about anything. So if you want a job here, uh, you're welcome. And I'm sitting there looking like, huh? Like, because mm-hmm. like I said, this isn't what I set out to do. Right. And she was like, well, I said, yeah, like, I'm definitely, yes, uh huh, yeah. And so if I give anybody props for the radio, it would be Fort Master Flex. But as far as me doing my thing, it was just me and my hard work because that's what made him recognize, you know what mm-hmm. I'm saying, what I was doing. From there, it was just like. That's an amazing story. Yeah, it was just like I was going hard. Every every mixtape that I put out, I went hard. I remember a time where, um, if anybody in the industry know who James Cruz is, James Cruz worked for Bad Boy Records. It might have been around 95, 96. And um, I went to Bad Boy Records and I asked to get some promos. That's when they would give you the promo vinyls and records for you to put on a mixtape. And i never forget going up there. And, you know, it was like a glass door. Like, you couldn't go in. Like you got out the elevator with the glass door. You had to hit the buzzer. And James Cruz came out. He said, yo, how can I help you? I said, yo, my name is DJ K. Slay. You know, I'm doing mixtapes. You know, I'm trying to get some promos. And he was like, well, where's the mixtapes at? I said, I'm trying to get the promos to make the mixtapes. Right. I ain't got them. He was like, well, how you know you ain't going to, how we, pardon me, how we know you're not going to sell the records. I said, fuck, I look like selling some records. Look, I got, look, because I had jewelry on and everything. Right. I said, I ain't trying to sell no records. And then when he said that, Mr. C, um, anybody know who Mr. C is, came walking out from the glass with a whole arm full of joints. So I looked at him. I said, bruh. He was like, well, that's DJ Mr. C right there. You're not Mr. C. I said, yo, everything I love, I'm going to grind. I'm going to make it to where y'all going to be begging me not to play these records that y'all got coming out. He said, all right, well, do that. I said, okay. And that's what I did. I went hard. And I'll never forget the time. Shout to Sean. And Sean is my dude. And um, he did a mixtape with me before he went to penitentiary and everything. We had a good mm-hmm. real relationship. And I got a hold of Sean album ahead of time. Because what I would do was find interns that they wasn't paying. <laughs> yep. And I would get them bread. They're like, look. Man, do leave this desk or whatever. It's an exclusive laying around. Record it. Give me a copy of it. Here, here's a hundred dollars. They're not getting nothing. Mm-hmm. So I learned how to manipulate ANR's uh, interns with money, and I got a whole Shine album. So me and Shine was cool, so I wasn't gonna violate him. Right. But I played a record that wasn't supposed to be out. Mm. on a mixtape and I'll never forget some dude named Conrad called me that worked up there and he was like yo uh, and this is bad boy same mm. label that James Cruz right. was shitting on me with he was like yo 